go first as I've been um, talking quite a bit already. Uh, I am happy to. Um, thank you, Senator Hines, and uh, thank you, Chair Barrett and Chair Roy and committee for hearing my testimony, along with Senator Hines on the issue of biomass in the Commonwealth. I've really uh, been glued to this morning's hearing and grateful to you for convening it. Part of the regulations before the committee today stipulate that biomass would not be RPS class one eligible if they're located within five miles of an environmental justice community, as we've heard. And although these regulations are new, this issue, as you well know, is not. Back in 2009, advocates were mobilizing to put a question about biomass eligibility uh, in the RPS on the ballot when then Governor Deval Patrick commissioned a report on the issue. The resulting 182 page report as discussed earlier this morning was very clear that biomass was not carbon neutral and emits more carbon than natural gas. The Patrick administration tightened sustainability and efficiency standards for biomass plants and as a result, uh, as a result of that report. We're going to fast forward now to 2019 and Governor Baker's proposed efficiency standard rollbacks. This would have allowed a biomass plant proposed for Springfield arguably the asthma capital of the nation, to claim millions of dollars in RPS credits annually, virtually ensuring its construction. Most of us know what happened next. Chairs, a years-long tidal wave of activism urged DOER to reverse course and deny a permit to the proposed plan in Springfield. And good for DOER for following this course of action. And here I'm appreciative of the leadership and expertise of Secretary Theo Herides and her team, and of course the commissioner. Environmental justice communities across the Commonwealth have borne the brunt of pollution for generations and tragically, the impact can clearly be seen in the health outcomes of residents. Their activism was based in science, the communities that responded. About five years ago, a cadre of leading health organizations sent a letter to Congress, which included this powerful indictment, quote, biomass is far from clean. Burning biomass creates air pollution that causes a sweeping array of health harms from asthma attacks to cancer to heart attacks, resulting in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and premature deaths, end quote. Science has also shown that we, as a state and a nation, need to increase carbon sequestration from our forests and our natural and working lands if we want to have a chance, a chance of meeting our climate goals our finite tax dollars should be incentivizing the protection of land, the growth of forests, as opposed to the burning of wood at an industrial scale. When DOER rightly changed course in Springfield uh, with regard to the Springfield biomass plant, it arrived at these new proposed regulations, which stipulate that biomass facilities located within five miles of an environmental justice community would not be eligible for RPS subsidies. By proposing that biomass plants cited near environmental justice communities would not be RPS eligible, DOER is clearly acknowledging that environmental justice communities cannot and should not bear the negative health impacts of large-scale biomass plants. But here's the flip side of that proposal, and this has already been stated, Chairs. About 11% of the state, including three communities in my district and 21 communities west of the Quabbin Reservoir, which is, of course, Boston's drinking water, um, would become the only places in the state where biomass facilities uh, are RPS eligible. It doesn't matter where a facility is sited in Massachusetts or elsewhere, the science still says no. The logic here in these regulations is tortured. A biomass plant sited more than five miles away from the nearest environmental justice community is not any greener than a biomass plant in Springfield. The location of the facility has never been a factor in RPS Class 1 eligibility. Class 1 should be reserved for the cleanest energy sources, the truly green infrastructure that we want to see companies invest in, because we know it's the energy infrastructure for a sustainable future. As I close, I, I strongly urge us to learn the brutal lessons from COVID-19. Exposure to air pollution can cause respiratory and cardiovascular disease. Those with pre-existing respiratory conditions are more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to die from COVID-19. That's what the science says. There is no mystery to this deadly equation. 
When we expose our residents to environmental harms, they become less healthy and more vulnerable. I suggest that a key lesson we learn from this pandemic is to recognize once and for all, Chairs, the inextricable tie between our climate and our health. In May of this year, dozens of national climate and public health organizations released a declaration on climate change and health, calling on President Biden and Congress to, quote, heed the clear scientific evidence and take steps now to dramatically reduce pollution that drives climate change and harms health, end quote. These groups called for, quote, measures to secure dramatic reductions in carbon emissions from power plants, including rapid phase out of power plants that burn fossil fuels, biomass, and waste for energy. Earlier this week, as wildfire smoke from the West Coast blew across the entire nation and turned Massachusetts skies hazy and made our air dangerous to breathe, it was a stark reminder that we are all in this climate crisis together. And being in this together means removing biomass from RPS class one eligibility. Thank you so much for considering my testimony. And thank um, you, Senator. Uh, Senator Hines.